Hi, um. So today we're going to talk about injuries in a yoga class or uh, prevention of injuries. And this is a fairly new subject in the yoga world, last uh, eight or nine years, I'd say. And uh, the reason being is that yoga and injury have never been in the same sentence. There was no such thing as a yoga injury. But in recent years, uh, yoga injuries have become something fairly, fairly common. In fact, almost every teacher training course um, where we teach this lecture, I always ask the question, has anyone had an injury in a yoga class? And every single class, there's at least one or two people who have been injured in it. So it's, it's pretty sad that um, things are happening in this way. The other uh, reason yoga injuries became a little bit more well known was that about seven or eight years ago, there was an article in the New York Times and the article was all about how yoga can wreck your body. And when the article came out, there was a lot of discussion about yoga and the styles of yoga and the way yoga is being practiced. Um, a lot of teachers and students um, you know, told others about how they'd injured themselves and what was happening and it was really big, big news. Uh, even the yoga magazines, they had surveys in different countries of how people had injured themselves. So yoga injuries became a thing, you can say. And so for you, it's going to be really important to know how to teach in a safe way that doesn't create any kind of injuries to your students. And even just for yourself to make sure that you're practicing in a safe way and you don't injure yourself. So that's what this lecture is going to be about for so first we'll look at what is an injury? So it can be physical damage to any part of the body. It can be stress and strain, so going beyond one's limits, one's comfort. It can be trauma, accidents, you know, maybe when you're going into a headstand and you fall out of it, or you'd come into some kind of arm balance and you slip. So that kind of thing is fairly common unfortunately. Uh, it can be damage to the joints, muscles, ligaments, tendons, and we'll talk a bit about that in the next slide too. And it can also be irritation to the nerves. And most commonly, uh, the nerve that gets irritated is the sciatic nerve. Uh, so the sciatic nerves coming down the spine and then separating down each leg. So there can be compression onto the sciatic nerve. And if it's, if it's mild, it's just going to be like a lower back pain. And if it's a little bit stronger, there'll be some pain, numbness or tingling going down into the bottom. And if it's really bad, it will reach all the way down to the foot and they won't be able to walk either. And that's actually really, really common condition. And yoga can really make it worse, but it can also heal it. So it's really important to understand what is helpful and what isn't. And that's where we'll have a whole lecture on back pain and yoga. So you get a better understanding of that. But the sciatic nerve is the main one that can be irritated. The other nerves that can be irritated are the ones coming down to the hands. So that's particularly from people that are holding certain poses for a longer period of time, like Shishasan, the headstand and sarangas on the shoulder stand. So especially if they're held for more than 15, 20 minutes, and some people hold them for a really long time, like half an hour, 45 minutes, even an hour. And if one is doing that over a long period of time, then it can create this problem. So we'll move to... So injuries can occur from overuse or misuse. So if we're doing a pose in the wrong way, or if we keep doing a pose over and over and over again. So I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, she was new to yoga and she learnt Virasan, the warrior pose. And she loved it. So she kept doing it all the time at home. And I'm not sure how she was doing it, but one day she did it and her knee just popped. And she was, you know, in her early twenties at that time, very healthy. And uh, she had to have surgery because of that. Now, I feel that she must have had not enough distance between her feet. So her knee was bent past her ankle and that created that pressure being put into her knee. And obviously she didn't know that it should be comfortable all the time. So 
it can happen in this way. It can happen in a way that, okay, I've just learned a new pose and I really, really love it and I want to be getting better at it. So I just practice it over and over and over again. So it's really important that we don't overdo our practice either. If we have learned a new pose and we really enjoy it, yes, we can do it every day, but once is enough. We don't have to keep repeating it over and over again. Otherwise, this, this creates this uh, injury, repetitive stress injury, which I'm sure many of you know, RSI. It's a very, very common uh, injury. Then we have a sprain. So a sprain is an injury to the ligament, a ligament in the joints. And a sprain can actually take quite a long time to heal. It may take a few months. And even after that healing has occurred, it can be a weaker joint. So example, if I've sprained my ankle, it's healed, I think it's fine, I go and do a one leg balancing pose, and again, uh, that same problem comes back, returns. So a sprain will take quite a bit of time to heal. Then we have a strain. So a strain is just like a pulled muscle. And for example, maybe I was doing forward bend, and I held it for a little bit too long or I was bending too far forward. So the next day I can feel it in my hamstring and a little bit of massage can be helpful for that or just a really gentle stretching. But that is going to heal in one or two days. That's not going to take very long. So looking at the higher risk areas, so basically all of the joints are risk factors when we're doing asanas, uh, but particularly the knee is a very common one um, because a lot of people have knee pain. Uh, the general public, you can say probably at least 20 to 25 percent of students will have knee pain. Uh, and that's just the general public. If you've got, say, elderly, um, then it's going to be higher. Uh, so with the knees, we have to be really, really careful because we have a lot of poses that are putting stress on the knees. If you think of all sitting positions, most of them, most of the crossing cross leg positions are putting stress onto the knee. Then we've got all the standing poses as well. So you have to take a lot of care um, for someone that does have knee pain. Then we have ankles. So especially if someone's broken the ankle before, their ankles are gonna be much weaker. This can create problems for sitting positions and of course for all standing poses too. Then we have neck. A lot of people have neck pain, very, very common. So automatically you can start thinking, all right, we don't want to be doing shoulder stand, um, sarangasana, we don't want to do viparit kani, the inverted pose, and halasana, the plow is also one we want to avoid. But even certain simple neck movements we need to take care of. Even thinking about things like majarasana, the cat pose. So with that gentle movement of the neck, we have to be even more careful. And sometimes if someone has neck pain, it can be when they uh, bring their chin towards their chest that creates more of the problem. And for some, it's the other direction. So it depends on what the reason is for their neck pain. Then elbows is pretty common. Shoulders also, elbows and shoulders, both very common uh, problems can be there due to sports. A lot of people have injured themselves um, because of that. And also many people have weak wrists. So think of things like cobra pose, plank position, downward dog, all of that is putting quite a bit of stress onto the wrists. Next, looking at weak muscles. So before we look at that, if I tell all of you to sit, to come into a cobra pose, Bojangasan, now everyone will feel it slightly differently. Some of you will feel it in your lower back, which will be pretty common. Some of you will feel it in your wrists especially if you've had uh, wrist pain before. Some of you will feel it in your shoulders. Some of you will feel it in your neck. So everyone will feel it slightly different. Of course, there are areas that are more common, like the lower back, but we all have different body shapes. We've all had different experiences with our body, and we all have different areas of our body that are stronger and areas that are weaker. So when we do a yoga pose, we are gonna feel the area that is weaker. So that's where it's important that we don't compare ourselves to others because um, 
we all have our different bodies. And why could it be weaker? Well, it could be because I've had an injury in the past. It could be because of my occupation, the way I stand, the way I do things. Uh, it can be genetic. There are a lot of reasons why we have weaknesses in some parts and strengths in the other parts. So what is important for you to remember is you're teaching a class, everyone does it, but they all feel it slightly differently and they feel it in that area that is weaker for them. So once we know what our weak areas are, then that helps us to change our yoga practice in the best possible way. Then we have uh, the ligaments in the joints can create sprains like we've already discussed. There can be damage to the ligaments, there can be damage to the nerves, as I've mentioned about sciatica and um, the nerves coming down into the hands. And then there can be the risk of fracture, bones. Now, some of you will think, oh, really? You could break a bone in yoga? Well, yeah, it can happen. Uh, it can happen because, all right, I, I do a headstand or a handstand and I fall over. I can break a bone in that way. Um, it can be for many reasons, and I'll, I'll tell you two stories. One is a friend of mine who used to do yoga competitions, and the first thing you'll say is, yoga competitions? I thought yoga is not supposed to be competitive. Well, that's true. It's not supposed to be. But uh, there are a lot of yoga competitions in India because they're a way of trying, like lots of organizations do them to try to bring younger people to yoga. Uh, but ideally, there shouldn't be any. So she was a, in the yoga competition at the top level on the stage, put her foot behind her head in a standing position, which is nothing in the yoga competition world. So she pushed her foot down her back. And by doing so, she broke her femur, which is her thigh bone, which is one of the strongest bones in the body. And so it's quite amazing. I feel quite amazing that a, a girl, she was 17 at the time, actually could break her own bone. Now that's one story. The second story I'll tell you is of a lady. She was doing the same position, foot behind the head, but laying down, so in a supine position. And the teacher came over and pressed both of her thighs and broke her thigh, thigh bone, femur. So it can happen from ourselves, like we can do it ourselves, and also a teacher can do it to us. So it is really important that we take care of our whole body because uh, our bones can also break if we're not being careful. And that's not even taking into consideration uh, the student who has osteoporosis. So what causes injury in a yoga class? Well, I've already covered some of that. Trauma or accident in a pose. People can slip out of poses as well. You know, um, they can fall onto the wall. I've heard many times of stories like this where people have uh, tried to do, say, a headstand near the wall, they've fallen against the wall and they've damaged their body. Then forcing yourself into a pose. So if you had this idea that, ah, oh, I want to do the pose just like my teacher or just like the person next to me, then without really listening to your body and just forcing yourself into it, that can create pain and injuries. And then if the teacher forces a student into the pose, so this is really important for us when we're training to be teachers, that we have to understand that everybody is different. Everyone's body has had different experiences. We have different levels of flexibility um, and we might have had injuries in the past. So there's lots of factors there, um, which means that we should never be pushing somebody into a pose. And we'll talk a lot about this later um, when we talk about the role of a yoga teacher and about how to correct because that's a really um, big thing now. Then looking at no or less awareness of body pain and fatigue. So this is especially the case for new students. Um, if they've never done yoga before, they don't really understand their body. They're not very aware of their body. And you'll know it when you start telling them, okay, bend your left knee or do this, do that. And they don't really understand what they're doing. So it's important to build awareness in your students. So if they do have any kind of pain, they can identify what is causing it. So for example, someone might say to you at the end of the class, oh, my back hurts. And you say, oh, 
do you remember what position it was that uh, caused that pain? I go, no, I don't know. They didn't really pay attention, you know, for that whole hour. So it's important that we are building their awareness so they understand how their body feels when they're coming into a pose, when they're holding a pose, when they're releasing a pose. And then after that, so they can start to identify like, that, oh, maybe when I did that Bhujangasana Cobra, maybe I shouldn't have had my arms straight because it was too strong a back bend. Maybe I should have been bending my elbows. So these things, um, they will learn over time, but we have to try to build that awareness. Then not understanding the weaker links, joints and muscles in the body. So this links to that, that point as well, that um, a new student won't really understand their body very well until they've practiced more. So once they've done a little bit more practice, they'll understand what positions are really suiting them, what positions are more difficult, where they might need to take a modification or a variation um, to, to achieve that position. Then not paying attention to important alignment principles in asana. So we're going to go through that in the, the practical class. And um, for example, you think of Ardha Matsendras and the half spinal twist. So many times people are like really pushing. They want to be able to hold their foot with their hand because they think that's the proper, proper position. But by doing so, they're hunching their back uh, so that they can actually hold their foot. Now, what is more important? The spine should be upright and then we're twisting because the whole point of the pose is to get a twist. It's not to get a um, forward bend. Okay, and it's not to reach towards the foot because many times that will just be giving that stretch into the arm and into the elbow. So it's important that we understand how our body is supposed to be aligned in every asana. So looking at the yogic principles of asana, and you've just been going through this, slow controlled movements correlated with the breath to move in and out of poses. When we do movements very slowly, we have a lot more awareness. And by using the breath, that also helps us to slow down. And then when we're in the position, stira sukhamasana, the steady, comfortable position, which we're holding. Next, looking at the reflexes, so the myotadic stretch reflex or the knee jerk reaction or reflex. So you all have heard of that when you you sit on a chair and someone uh, knocks your knee, so automatically you kick, your leg comes forward. So that reaction is um, happening to protect your joints. Um, but because of this uh, reaction, it shortens the muscles and it makes everything much tighter, which is not what we want to be happening. Uh, so here I'll just read this quote to you, which has pretty much explained it all. In Hatha Yoga, we usually want to minimize the effects of the myotatic stretch reflex because even moderately dynamic movements will fire the receptors, stimulate the motor neurons, shorten the muscles and thereby limit the stretch. Any dynamic movement in Hatha Yoga activates the myotatic stretch reflex. So if you're doing bouncy sun salutations, if you're jumping in and out of poses, um, basically all these kind of exercises, especially when we're, we're not really having a lot of awareness of our body and we're moving around like that, um, they can be used as a warm up. But if you want to go deeper, if you want to lengthen the muscles to improve your flexibility, then you need to move slowly. So especially moving into the poses and out of the poses, it's really important so you don't get that reaction. Then we've got the flexion reflexes. So uh, example, the pain reflex of when you say touching a hot plate, immediately you get that jerk reaction uh, where you bring your hand away from it. So that creates a lot of tension uh, physically <laughs> as well as the mental tension um, can be there too. And that creates tension not just at that place, that area, but it can create tension throughout the body. And this can come into effect whenever we're pushing ourselves into a pose. Yeah, or if we're having any kind of pain or discomfort, discomfort, we will feel that. Uh, so it can happen straight away or sometimes it will be the next day as well. So we don't want to be bouncing into a position. 
and then the clasp knife reflex so that's actually the one that we want to have when we're practicing yoga so that's where the muscle starts to relax instead of contracting like it did with the other ones so that happens when we're holding a yoga pose for at least 15 seconds 15 to 20 seconds so automatically the muscle starts to relax so that's what we want to achieve so that's why we want to try to hold poses for at least 15 seconds or more so that we get that deeper effect because if we can relax the muscles then we can start to also have that benefit on the internal organs so how to prevent injuries this is really important for us as yoga teachers so we want to have a gentle caring approach towards the body so we want to try to encourage our students to be having this way of thinking and uh, it's really important because a lot of uh, students they're not very gentle with themselves they're quite violent in fact many people want to push and pull themselves in yoga poses and they think that's the right way of doing it so it's really important for them to be soft and caring and respectful uh, of themselves then understanding the limits of the body and accepting them that is also really really important because um, we don't want to overstep our own limits we want to be listening to our body and understanding what is right for our body and changing things accordingly. It doesn't mean that we should never progress. We should still be working on our weaknesses so we can be moving forward and advancing in our practice, but we need to listen to our body. So even just the small thing of, say, halas and the plow pose, maybe yesterday evening I did it and my feet touched the ground and I was very happy. This morning I can't do it because I haven't had all day to warm up my body and um, my feet are still quite a distance but that's okay I have to accept that okay it's the morning time I need a little bit more warm up uh, and then I'll be able to achieve that position so it's important to accept how we are in this moment then avoiding competition so <laughs> we don't want to have a yoga competition here uh, it is important to avoid that competition with other students in the room and also with the teacher. Many, many students, they want to copy exactly how the teacher is doing things. And it's important that they really listen to their own body and look at their own body. And instead of uh, connecting their mind with somebody else's body, they need to be connecting with their own body. So it's really important that they don't have that competitive attitude because yoga is very much an individual journey. Then paying attention to fatigue and pain or tenderness of the body parts during and after the practice. So during the practice, when we're coming into a pose, when we're holding a pose, when we're releasing the pose, and then afterwards, how we're feeling. So if we just go from pose to pose to pose to pose without any breaks in between, we can't really understand. So it's really important that the class is well put together with little breaks in it and making sure that they're building their awareness of how they're feeling throughout the practice. Then understanding if there is pain or discomfort and what is a comfortable stretch. We want to have a comfortable stretch. We should be having a stretch but it shouldn't be creating pain. So it's really important to listen to what the body is telling us. Then warming up. So different types of warm up movements are there to warm up the joints, but then we also want to do yoga poses that are going to be warming up for more advanced ones. So example, you didn't learn halasan on the first day, halasan the plow pose. Instead you learnt Ekapada Uttanpadasan, the one leg raise pose. Then you moved on to Dvipada Uttanpadasan, two leg raise pose. Then you moved on to Vipretkani, inverted pose. Then Sarangasan, shoulder stand. And then Halasan, the plow pose. So all of those are lead up to the more advanced pose. So you'll see it in the class, it will become clearer and clearer, this progressive approach that we have for practicing. So instead of just doing a difficult pose without any kind of warm ups, we're warming up with movements, then we're warming up with asanas, and then we try to do that more difficult position. And then 
for the different kinds of poses. If we can't achieve that position, we need to know what options to take. So maybe it's that I need to take a different variation. Maybe I need to use a cushion or prop or something like that. There are many different kinds of variations. You'll be learning many of them in your class. And you'll also see that there are many in the big book that you can use. And you'll also learn many new variations yourself. The more you, you teach, the more experience you'll gain on different uh, options and variations because even your students will teach you variations because naturally they move into positions that they feel comfortable in. And you might not have even thought of those kind of variations, but they are suitable. So understanding what kind of modifications may be needed for more difficult poses and having that really progressive approach to asanas. So building up over a period of time. In the book, you'll see there's um, poses that will prepare you, preparatory poses for a particular asana. And then there are also follow up asanas. So ones that uh, will continue on. Sometimes they might be more advanced. Sometimes they might be more as counter poses. So the counter positions are also really important to relieve any excess strain. So imagine if you've done a class and it's only back bends, only back bends. Now, of course, there are many different yoga classes which focus on back bends. Maybe they're leading up to a very advanced back bend, but they won't only be back bends. There'll be forward bends in there, there'll be twists, there'll be relaxation. All of this is essential uh, to have in our class. And we'll go into more of that in lesson planning. How to have a well-balanced class is really important. Then the slow controlled movements, as we've mentioned, using the breath. Okay? If they're very slow, we have a lot more awareness and understanding of how our body is feeling. And then that steadiness. So when we're holding the position, we shouldn't be shaking. It should be comfortable. It should be steady. And it should be relaxed. And then we had the class knife reflex, as we've mentioned. So we always want to be activating that reflex. Then making sure that the teacher knows of any kind of medical conditions, injuries, illnesses or problems so that they can better cater and adapt to the student. So it's really helpful to have that questionnaire at the beginning for any new students to fill out the form, write down any problems that they might be having. And it's important to have it on paper because as teachers, when we start having more and more students, we can't remember everyone's little problems that they might be having. And some of them might be quite mild problems. So we need to have that information with us but it's also a student's responsibility to let the teacher know too, because things can change. They might have filled out that form six months ago, but last week they had an accident and they hurt their back. So it's important that the student also tells the teacher if anything has changed so that the teacher can uh, plan the class and, and guide the student in the best possible way. Then the next point is maintaining the asana at 70%. Now you've heard about this a lot in the physiology of yoga poses. So we don't want to do 100% or 110%. We want to stay at around about 70% so that it's going to be comfortable for us. But we're still going to get the benefits. Then following the basic alignment principles, as we've mentioned before. So example, if you're um, doing Ardha Matsundrasana, keeping the spine upright. If you're doing a standing pose, uh, like warrior pose, like we mentioned earlier, not having your knee going past your ankle. So every pose has its important principles um, regarding alignment that we need to follow. And this last question here is just something to think about. Are you practicing traditional yoga, Western contortionism, military drills or gymnastics? So that's just something we have to think of. How do we want to represent yoga? What do we want to be doing in our yoga class? What is important to have in the class? And I asked this question because I remember one TTC we were doing in another country and out of the students, half the students could do handstand because handstand is really popular these days, but hardly any of the students could do Ardha Matsundrasana, the half spinal twist. So we have to think about 
okay, what is popular, but also what is going to be most helpful for them? And we need to find a balance. So having those, you know, exciting poses that everyone wants to do, but also doing the poses that are really going to benefit the students too. So if there is an injury, if one of your students has an injury and it might not come from a yoga class, hopefully it hasn't come from your yoga class, but it might have been that they've injured themselves elsewhere and they've come to the class. So you need to know what to do. So the rice principle is a very common technique used in first aid worldwide. Uh, rest, of course, ice, compression and elevation. And many times another R is added at the end, which is repeat. So this we can use for the acute injuries, uh, depending on where the injury is and if it suits, um, but that is a very common uh, practice to do. Then we have relaxation and breath awareness. So this is really, really helpful because if my body and mind is relaxed, I can heal myself much faster. If I'm really, really stressed, then all my energy is going towards that instead of towards healing my body. So the more relaxation we can do, the faster the healing. So that's where yoga nidra, meditation, gentle pranayam, um, all these kind of things are going to be really, really helpful. Long guided shavasanas, all of this will be helpful to, to do. Then slow, controlled and gentle movements to improve the blood circulation will help with the healing. But this is especially the case in chronic injuries. If it's acute and there's already a lot of inflammation, then we don't want to do all these kind of movements because um, that will just increase that inflammation. So sometimes we have to just take a step back and say, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna have a little break from yoga for a little while and just allow my body to be healing. Well, yoga asanas and yoga movements, I mean, of course, all the other things can still be done. And moving on to massage. So massage can also help. But again, if there is inflammation, you can't massage it. So especially chronic injuries, massage can be especially helpful. Then here I have use of medication with a question mark. And I'll go back to that story. If you remember the story of the lady where her leg was broken by the teacher. So she had been taking pain medication. And when the teacher went to do the correction, adjustment, whatever you like to call it. The teacher said, does that feel okay? And the, the student said, yes, because the student had so much pain medication, they couldn't feel it. So their leg was broken. So this can happen and it's actually really, really dangerous because just by taking that pain medication does not heal the injury, but it blocks the um, signal telling the body that the pain is there. So we can actually do a lot more damage to ourselves if we're on painkillers. So it's really important that you know if your student is taking uh, any kind of pain medications. And it's actually really, really common. A lot of students are taking really high doses of painkillers. So if you do have a student that comes in your class that is taking those, you need to do really, really gentle practices so that there's no damage that's going to occur. And the last point is the one that no one wants to hear. Give time to the body to heal itself. Every body has that innate healing capacity, but the time has to be given. And we never want to do that because we want to keep going, going, going. We want to do our yoga poses and we don't want to just rest it. So that resting will help with that healing. And I'll just tell you a short story of one of our students long back. He did his teacher training and he went home. And then a few months later, he sent me an email and he said, oh, Kate, I've had my first yoga injury. And he was feeling really, really sad. And it was because he had a student in his class who had done a lot of exercise, a lot of sports, bodybuilding and all this kind of stuff. And he came to yoga. And the teacher had been telling him, listen to your body, don't be competitive, all this kind of stuff that we've been talking about. But the student damaged himself. And actually he, he flared up his sciatica. And afterwards the student came to our teacher and said, look, I know you said to listen to my body and all of these things. Now I understand, but you, you were a good teacher and it was my fault. And this might happen to you. 
because many times students are not ready to listen. They don't want to slow down. If they've been in competitive sports all their life, it can be really, really hard for them to just slow down and listen and not look at everybody else. So it can be a challenge with some certain students. So next, a few things to remember for ourselves when we're practicing is to have that respect for your body. Then focusing your attention on yourself, not on anyone else. Focusing on the breath, focusing on the muscle that is getting stretched or the muscles, focusing on the joints, on the speed of the movement, on the relationship between the breath and the stretching. Because you'll find that with every exhalation, the body starts to relax a little bit more. So there's lots of things that we can be focusing on when we're in the pose. Now looking at this next uh, sentence here, practicing with total attention is advanced yoga, no matter how easy the pose. Practicing with scattered attention is the practice of a beginner, no matter how difficult the pose. And this is something I also always want uh, our students, teachers to understand because many times we compare ourselves to someone who is more advanced in their asana practice or we think they're more advanced because they're more flexible but it's not about how they look it's all about what's going on inside so an example you've got two people one person has dance experience or gymnastics experience and they're very flexible they do forward bend paschimottanasana and they're completely flat the other person next to them might be new to yoga don't have any experience with gymnastics, dance, anything like that. And they're pretty tight and they're finding it really hard. They can't reach their toes and they're pretty much just like an L shape, but they're focusing. Now, the super flexible person, you know, she's thinking, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do today. And, you know, thoughts are going completely away from herself or himself. Whereas the person who may be not so flexible but is focusing completely on what they're doing. They're focusing on relaxing in the pose, on the breath, noticing the stretch, uh, noticing how they're feeling uh, mentally as well, trying to stay as focused as possible. That is advanced. So that's what we want our students to understand, that it doesn't matter how flexible you are, it's all about what is happening internally. And the next point, awareness of the breath. So having that awareness will make you more aware of how your position is, if there is any kind of discomfort, because if there is discomfort, you'll find that the breathing is not going to be as slow and it may be quite shallow. Uh, and then, of course, if we are aware of our breath, we will be able to start relaxing more and more. So there'll be mental relaxation, which in turn will create physical relaxation. And mus once that muscular um, relaxation is happening, then we'll be able to have that massage of the internal organs and get those internal benefits. So next, looking at the foundation and purpose of the pose. So we want to know why we're going to practice each position and we need to know how we can warm up our body so that we can achieve that pose as best as possible. And also so we understand how we can gain maximum benefits from that position. Then moving in and out of poses we've mentioned before. So having that nice, slow, controlled movement with the breath as we come into a pose and as we come out of a pose. And if we're very aware as we come in, we'll understand how our body is feeling, if there's a little bit of tightness, if there's any discomfort or if there's any pain. So this is really important to have that awareness. And then honoring the suggestion of the pain. So if there is pain, Think about what do you do if you're feeling pain in your body when you're doing an asana? Do you listen to it? Do you change what you're doing? Example, if you have back pain, do you change your posture? Maybe you're doing uh, bhujangasana, okay, the regular bhujangasana, cobra pose, and you're feeling back pain. So do you bend your elbows a little bit? Do you stop tilting your head so far back and look forward? Do you bring your feet a little bit further apart? So all of those things will help to make your position a little bit easier. Or do you say, it's okay, I'm just going to hold it another 20 seconds. I'll just wait until the teacher says release it. So you have to think about 
what you're doing and how you're responding to your body telling you that that pain is there. Are you just getting so wrapped up in the challenge that you just forget about what your body's doing and how it's feeling? And now looking at the next point, pushing yourself into a painful stretch will not only cause injury, but create a state of fear and anxiety and your nervous system will remember those memories. It will store those memories so that the next time you go to do that pose, those memories will come up and the body can become very tense and tight. Many of you would have done it had it happened before if you've done headstand shishasan. Maybe you tried to come into it and you fell out of it. So the next time you go to do it, you're a little bit scared and your body might be feeling very tense. I'll tell you a short story of one of our students. She had uh, injured her back doing yoga before coming to the teacher training course. So she had back pain and we wouldn't allow her to do any strong back bends because of this. And so she did really gentle back bends and lots of things to help her back and it healed very fast. And then it was the time for her to start bending back a little bit more to do the straight arm cobra pose. And when we told her, okay, let's let's try Saurahasta Bhujangasana, straight arm cobra, she was so scared because that was the position that had created the problem in the first place. So her body was remembering that and then creating, again, this high anxiety. So it's really important that we don't push ourselves and create pain, which is going to be remembered by us later on. And this last point here, pain is a gift. It is telling us that there's a problem. So we need to listen to why is the pain there and we need to act on it. So a few more points that we need to remember is being responsible for our actions, understanding our, our limitations and our weaknesses and having respect for ourselves, being cautious, sometimes uh, in the afternoons, because we've had all day to warm up, we can push ourselves a bit more because that flexibility is there, but it's really important that we don't overdo it. And then we need to be patient. So example, I really want to be able to do Padmasan, Lotus Pose, but I can't just go and do the Lotus, force my legs into the Lotus Pose. I have to warm up myself very slowly. I have to work on my ankles, my knees, my hips. And over a period of time, I will be able to achieve that. But it will take time. So not having those expectations that, no, 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 because I'm going to be a yoga teacher, I need to be able to do Padmasana and I need to be able to do it for half an hour or one hour or two hours. Remove those expectations and just listen to your body and go steadily. And the last one here is our OM principle. So A is for acceptance. So accepting how your body is at this moment understanding why your body is how it is. Okay, so that understanding is really important. And then how to act on it, how to manage, how to merge. So how to do our practice that is going to be most helpful and beneficial for us. And this last slide is just a photo for you to think about when you're thinking about how you want to be as a yoga teacher, how you want to be correcting your students. So you can see here that he's not really in a very stable position and he's putting his feet on a part of the body that can create quite a bit of pain and especially for her poor hamstrings. So we have to think about how we want to be when we start to teach. And this is a little bit of preparation because we're going to be talking about this more in the coming weeks when we go more into the yoga teacher training uh, aspects. So that's all for today on injury prevention. Hurry on.